Thank you, Nisha, for your extremely kind words. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a great pleasure to be here today and speak to you about our recent experiences in Sri Lanka. In fact, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Ambassador William Taylor, the Executive Vice President of the USIP, and also Walter Lohman, Director, Asian Studies Center of the Heritage Foundation, for organizing this discussion today. Ladies and gentlemen, last February, in fact, exactly one year and one week ago, soon after the election of President Maitri Pala Sirisena, on the 8th of January, I visited Washington, Washington for the first time as Foreign Minister of the Siripa, Maitri Pala Sirisena Vikram Singh administration and stood before a similar audience in this great city and, uh, and outlined our, uh, our plans and mission for a new Sri Lanka. It has merely been a year, but looking back, it seems as if several years have passed since then. A year on, much has happened and much has been achieved. And as Nisha, Nisha said, much has to be achieved. The relation between our two, relationship between our two countries alone has ex experienced a veritable renaissance since the first visit of Assistant Secretary of State Biswal in January of 2015, weeks, a few days after the presidential election, and then again in August, immediately after the general elections. In such a short period of time, our relations have been strengthened to unprecedented heights. In fact, although our countries have maintained cordial ties for many, many years since independence, we can be proud that this cordiality has now, especially within the last year, has now blossomed into what I would like to call a very, very special friendship. In addition to Assistant Secretary Biswal's four visits this year, we have also had the honor of hosting a number of very senior U.S. leaders this year. May 2015 saw Secretary Kerry visit Colombo, the first official visit by a U.S. Secretary of State in over four decades. His visit was followed by a visit by Ambassador Samantha Power, and her visit in November marked by her trademark style of interactive, uh, interacting actively and freely with, uh, with, all, with all whom she encountered, infused U.S.-Sri Lanka re relations with renewed energy. Assistant Secretary for Democracy, Rights and Labor, Tom Malinowski also visited us and has remained consistently engaged with our progress. And finally, Ambassador Thomas Shannon's visit in December saw us firm up the details of the partnership dialogue between our two countries, which is what brings me back to this wonderful city for its inaugural meeting tomorrow, tomorrow morning. My topic today, ladies and gentlemen, is advancing reconciliation and development in Sri Lanka. I will not attempt to list the many steps that have been undertaken to foster reconciliation, strengthen good governance, the rule of law, accountability, and human rights since January 2015. This audience is an informed audience, and I'm sure you all follow Sri Lanka with a keen eye. Therefore, I will try to focus more on the specific topic. Ladies and gentlemen, reconciliation and development, as you would agree, are intertwined and it is difficult, almost impossible, to have one without the other. In fact, at the time we gained the independence, in February 1948, Sri Lanka, then of course known as Ceylon, 
was in a unique position amongst, amongst the countries in the developing world, as she had experience of representative government and was the oldest democracy in Asia. In fact, as you know, the universal franchise was introduced in Sri Lanka as early as 1931. And development indicators that were un uh, unparalleled in the developing world was also one of our proud claims at that period. In fact, an editorial published, I believe it was in the London Times on the 5th of February 1948, the day after we achieved independence, predicted a very bright future for the newly independent Ceylon and said that Sri Lanka with its human resources and natural resources will no doubt be the Switzerland of the East in no time. That was the kind of expectations the world had of Sri Lanka in 1948. The different communities in the country showed promise of being able to live and work towards common national goals in peace, harmony and unity up to independence. They had worked together in the past to gain independence from the British, despite the fact that they followed different faiths, spoke different languages and followed different customs. However, what followed after independence is something that the world knows only too well. We made mistakes, mistakes which saw our country plunge into torment and conflict for well over three decades. The failure to manage such justifiable grievances led to conflict and violence. Sri Lanka's post-independence le leadership, I must admit, was unable to come to terms with a diversity as a multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-religious and multilingual country. As a result, these grievances were transformed into intercommunal resentment and feeling of discrimi discrimination and unfair treatment. Our post-independent leaders, who were acutely aware of the diverse character of Aydin, sadly faltered at decisive moments and failed to stand up to extremism when they should have. As a result, Unmet grievances led to violence and ultimately created the conditions necessary for terrorism, which then transformed into a brutal war, as we all know. By the time the war ended, there were serious allegations of violations of human rights and war crimes hurled against both parties to the conflict, and Sri Lanka was by then facing virtual international isolation. Nonetheless, ladies and gentlemen, there was a collective sigh of relief across the entire country and many hoped in May 2009 that it would be the beginning of a new era of democracy and reconciliation in Sri Lanka. An unprecedented window of opportunity had to win the hearts and minds of the long-suffering people of the North and the East suddenly opened at that moment. However, unfortunately, that was not to be. The Rajapaksha administration, emboldened by their military victory over the LTTE, went on a rampage of, what I would call a rampage of triumphalism alienating the Tamil people even further, instead of using the goodwill generated in the war victory for healing, that historic opportunity was cruelly squandered to further the dynastic ambitions of the ruling family at the time, with the possibility of establishing a one-party state. However, the victory of President Sirisena in 2015 in January and the victory of the United National Front for Good Governance at the parliamentary elections in August, last year enabled the formation of a national unity government for the first time 
in the history of independent Sri Lanka. It unexpectedly heralded a new era for Sri Lanka. Traditional rivals in Sri Lankan politics, the United National Party led by Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe and the Sri Lanka Freedom Party led by President Sirisena came together to form a grand coalition for the first time since independence, heralding a new culture of consensus, consensual politi politics with the determination to create much needed political and policy stability. Today, for the first time in our country's history, under President Sirisena and Prime Minister Vikramasinghe, this myopia that plagued our nation since independence has been set aside. The temptation of political parties to follow a path of confrontation in order to achieve short-term political gains over the long-term interests of the people is now over and hopefully forever over. We also have in our leader of opposition, the Honorable R. Sambandan, the leader of the TNA, a wise, committed and respected politician with the resolve to work together to ensure that we do not let our country lose yet another golden window of opportunity. The National Unity Government has not wasted any time, ladies and gentlemen, in making the fullest use of this historic opportunity. In September last year, the government made a commitment in the form, as Nisha said, of co-sponsoring a resolution at the Human Rights Council in Geneva to strengthen good governance, foster reconciliation, promote human rights, establish accountability under the rule of law and ensure non-recurrence. Our government is totally committed to the successful implementation of this resolution, not because of any desire to appease the international community or international opinion, but because we sincerely believe, because we are convinced that Sri Lanka must, even at this late stage, come to terms with its past if we are to forge ahead and secure the future that Sri Lankan people truly deserve. As President Sirisena said just earlier this month, on the 4th of February in his independence speech, Independence Day speech, I quote, it is now time for us to seize the current opportunity that is before us to implement the provisions of the resolution. Not because of international pressure, but because as a nation we must imp implement these provisions for the sake of restoring the dignity of our nation, our people and our military. In order for Sri Lanka to regain her due position as a strong democracy among the community of nations." Unquote. In that resolution, ladies and gentlemen, we outlined a four-pillared strategy based on the principles of truth-seeking, accountability, reparations, and non-recurrence. This, this strategy resulted in a commitment to form a commission for truth, reconciliation, justice, and non-recurrence, an office on missing persons, a judicial mechanism or special courts to, to punish those who may have indulged in serious human rights violations and an office for reparations which will be set up by statute. We also said that the design of mechanisms will be preceded by a process of consultations involving all stakeholders, including victims on all sides, which will inform the design of the mechanisms. In fact, a consultation task force consisting of 11 eminent public figures has been appointed by the government to carry out the public consultations. The task force is currently working on consulting experts in finalizing the questions for the process and will be appointing provincial and district task forces to conduct face-to-face -face consultations and this group was introduced uh, uh, and presented to the civil society groups in Jaffna two weeks ago uh, by me and, and the work is now 
uh, underway. In the meantime, with the assistance of the United Nations Peace Building Fund, the Office for the National Unity and Reconciliation, and the Ministry of Resettlement are carrying out reconciliation-related related projects, including programs aimed at creating understanding among communities, psychosocial and livelihood support. Another important an essential component to ensure non-recurrence, we said, is the introduction of a new constitution, a constitution that guarantees, among other demo democratic reforms, the right of minorities in Sri Lanka. Addressing the parliament on the 9th of January, uh, the president uh, of Sri Lanka urged all members of parliament to extend their support to the adoption of a new constitution, and to those who argued that the executive presidency should be retained, because that was the only means by which Sri Lanka was able to combat terrorism successfully, he responded, Sri Lanka, rather than continuing with the executive presidency, anticipating a war in future, Sri Lanka should uh, complete the reforms that are necessary to ensure that war and violence will never occur again. The government's resolve to sec secure reconciliation, win the peace, and ensure uh, non-recurrence is firm. But in order to win the peace, develop and rising standards for each and every Sri Lankans, of course, is a sine qua non. All good intentions and political will, uh, we, uh, polit politics will not succeed unless all stakeholders feel that their development is being cared for and their lives are improving. Therefore, winning the peace is just as mu much about jobs, education, healthcare, and infrastructure for all Sri Lankan as it is about political reforms. The peace dividend must be felt in economic terms by all sections of Sri Lankan society. The peace dividend for the unemployed youth must be greater and better job opportunities, for the housewives, better living standards, for the farmers, a higher, price, uh, pri higher prices and access to markets, for the students, more schools, technical colleges and universities, with better trained teachers and lecturers, and for the elder elderly, greater access to health hospitals and free medicine. The government of Sri Lanka has no doubt as, no doubt, as the necessary political and economic reforms take place, investments and trade and ultimately jobs, growth and economic development will follow. But as the relationship between peace and development is holistic and dynamic, the faster the peace dividend, the greater and faster the likelihood and durability of peace. In a nutshell, the people's purses must also feel the benefits of the reconciliation peace and ethnic harmony program which we are conducting now. And they must feel that the difference as quickly as possible. Therefore, just as the world rallies around Sri Lanka with advice and support for our reconciliation process, at this critical time of transition, it is also imperative that the world rallies around us to kickstart the economy and catalyze our development journey. The government is working hard on this front too. We are putting in place a framework to sustain and accelerate Sri Lanka's 6% plus growth rate, create a million jobs in five years, and improve living standards through an ambitious economic development drive. The government's economic strategy is based on attracting foreign direct investment, making Sri Lanka's exports more competitive, promoting tourism, and improving productivity through education and knowledge transfer. Sri Lanka is at the center of a rapidly growing Indian Ocean region, astride the main east-west shipping route and next to one of the world's largest markets, India. We are leveraging this unique geoeconomic location to accelerate growth. Negotiations, negotiations are already underway to deepen our existing free trade agreement with India, which we hope to complete by the middle of the year. We plan to do the same with Pakistan, with whom we also have a free trade agreement. 
these agreements combined with our excellent air and sea connectivity, ladies and gentlemen, to the subcontinent will help cement our position as a gateway to the Indian subcontinent. We are also improving our market access further abroad due to the previous government's human rights violations. We lost the GSP plus concessions to the European Union following the successful visit of the EU Working Group on Human Rights Sri Lanka, we are now finalizing our formal application for GSP plus reapplication and we hope to regain the facility by the end of the year. We are also already in discussion to sign a free trade agreement with China. The United States is our single largest export market accounting for a quarter of Sri Lanka's exports. Sri Lanka has some concessionary access to the U.S. market through the GSP facility and has also signed an, a trade and investment framework agreement. Upgrading these ties by signing a free trade agreement will go a long way in propelling Sri Lanka to achieving its economic development. In addition, the government is very seriously exploring the possibility of applying to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership a leading government think tank is preparing a feasibility study and I believe that there will be a high-level delegation here in June this year led by the Ministry of Minister for International Trade uh, to discuss these issues. A concerted effort is also underway to improve the business climate domestically. Far-reaching gov governance reforms that are creating uh, rules-based, uh, have structurally made investments and business more secure and certain. Sri Lanka is taking measures to increase investors' ease of doing business and confidence more directly. For example, we are bringing a number of government agencies together to create a one-stop investment and trade facilita facilitation shop under the Agency of Development and the, the director or the head designate of that organization is also here with us uh, in, in, in Washington in our delegation and will be participating in tomorrow's uh, uh, dialogue. We are reviewing our laws and regulations to create a simple rules-based business environment, including those related to land ownership as well as tariffs and para-tariffs. We had adopted policies that enable private enterprise to try, for example, Sri Lanka has one of the lowest incomes tax rates in the world at 15%. Together, these reforms, alongside our educated workforce and solid infrastructure, are making Sri Lanka the most attractive, secure and competitive investment destination in the Asian region. As a result, during meetings with investors and businesses over the last few months, such as Prime Minister Vikramasinghe's meeting at the World Economic Forum at Davos, and during President Sirisena's state visit to Berlin and Vienna uh, last week, we have seen extraordinary and unprecedented, unprecedented levels of inter interest in investing in Sri Lanka. The interest the interest was well beyond our own expectations and we are confident that interest will quickly materialize into tangible commitments over the coming months. Sri Lanka is also experience, experiencing a tourism boom with arrivals last year growing by nearly 20% compared to 2014, which also saw double-digit growth. Ladies and gentlemen, but we also need to rapidly improve living standards across the board, especially the most vulnerable, uh, perhaps faster than the time lags that inevitably accompany investment and trade-led growth. At this critical time of transition, demonstrating that there is a peace dividend is of fundamental importance. We are working closely with the Millennium Challenge Corporation U.S. aid and other U.S. partners in this effort. We are also working closely with other bilateral and multilateral partners, including the World Bank and the ADB. But we need further and faster support 
in poverty alleviation, urban development, infrastructure development, education, particularly vocational, technical, and English language training, and agricultural productivity improvements. Ladies and gentlemen, our aim is to succeed for the sake of all our people, vindicating the faith, faith reposed on us by our friends in the international community, but more than anything else to do right by the people of our nation and our future generations and secure for them the destiny we were unable to achieve 68 years, uh, for 68 years since independence. I believe that the government and people of Sri Lanka will, with the help of friends in the international community, including the United States of America, finally succeed in creating a country where each individual can live and work with dignity, with self-esteem and confidence in the future. Allow me, ladies and gentlemen, finally to conclude by quoting from one of my own speeches uh, in, uh, at the Human Rights Council last September. I quote, uh, therefore, I say to the skeptics, don't judge us by the broken promises, experiences and U-turns of the past. Let us define, define and create our future by our hopes and aspirations and not be held back by the fears and prejudices of the past. Let us not be afraid to dream. Let us not be afraid to engage in meaningful dialogue aimed at finding solutions to problems as opposed to pointing fingers, heaping blame and scoring political points at the expense of future generations. My plea to you, ladies and gentlemen, is trust us, join us to work together and create the momentum required to move forward and take progressive, meaningful and transformative steps to create a new Sri Lanka. I thank you.